you want to give a gift to uh, in the free will offering, put it in the basket in the inside entrance of the church or over here in this basket. So, and uh, you can Harold, are you you're ready? Okay. And go ahead, uh, welcome, and look forward to your talk this evening. So tonight's topic is why be Catholic? And it seems to me, before we could talk about why, we, why we're Catholic, that we need to establish, is it reasonable to believe in God at all? Because so many of our young people today, as I mentioned, they leave your house <laughs> and they leave the faith. So is it reasonable to believe that God exists? And I want to Give you an, show you an example by telling you a real life situation that happened to me in a grocery store in Portland. Now, I was a dutiful husband, going shopping, I had my phone, I had the list of everything I was supposed to get. I'm walking down the aisle with the beans and the corn. And as I'm searching through, I notice a sh out of my peripheral vision, I notice a shopping cart coming the other way. I pay no attention to it. And then when I looked up, the cart had stopped. Now, unlike the priests, we permanent deacons typically don't wear clerics. I mean, we can wear them if we're doing official ministry, hospital, prison, or, I, or normally I just wear my crucifix, which I wear everywhere. So I look up, and the guy's looking at me, and he's looking at the crucifix. He goes, oh, you're one of those Jesus freaks. He goes, you know, your religion is the cause for all the problems in the world. And he starts ripping the Catholic faith, the Crusades, the Inquisition, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of his little tirade, he says, and you can't even prove to me that God exists. I said, oh, how about I show you that it's possible that God could exist? How about that? He said, okay. So I cleared some space on the shelf and the beans and the corn. I took out my cell phone and I put it on the shelf. Okay, now, let's have some fun. You're the atheist, okay? I'm going to ask you the same thing that I said to him. I put my phone on the shelf and I said, is my phone moving, yes or no? Anybody have a different answer than no? He said yes. Now, why did he say yes? Because the earth is moving. <sighs> I said, okay, smarty pants. Relative to the rotation of the earth, is the phone moving, yes or no? No. So the laws of physics would say this is an object that is at rest. It's in a state of potential motion because it's not actually moving. So in order to move this phone from a state of potential to actual motion, what has to be applied to this object? Force, which is mass times acceleration. So in order for this phone to move, I have to apply a force to it. I have to pick it up. I have to knock it over. Uh, there has to be an earthquake that shakes the store, that shakes the shelf, that knocks the phone on the ground, or else the phone will stay there forever. Because the laws of physics says an object that is at rest will continue to remain at rest unless impelled by a force. He said, yes, that's logic and science. Do we have objects in the universe that are moving? Yeah, come on, atheists. <laughs> yes, the earth is moving, the moon is moving, they're both moving around the sun. We have comets, asteroids, meteorites, light. We have all kinds of things that are moving. Well, cells. We're talking about space right now, Father. We'll, we'll get there. <laughs> so, I, so you agreed with me that things don't move unless impelled by a force. What caused all the movement in the first place? Big Bang, he said. And I said, I agree, because that was a theory developed by a Catholic priest. 
No, it wasn't. Ooh, ooh. Since my phone is in use, get out your phone. Go to Google. Type in Father George Lemaitre. Let me spell it for you. Tell me what the search results say. Oh, okay. <laughs> big Bang, since you brought up the Big Bang, tell me, my friend, what caused the Big Bang? Hmm? What, what caused the Big Bang? No. no. <laughs> you can't say, God, you're an atheist, remember? Bad atheist. He had the same answer as you, nothing. I said, you're 0 for 1. I said, let me give you a chance to redeem yourself. We're walking along the Amazon basin in South America. I drop my phone on the jungle floor. Not too far behind me, there are a group of Yanomamo Indians that are indigenous to that region. They're on a hunting expedition. They find my phone. They pick it up. They've never seen, felt, experienced anything like this technology before. Would they think that this phone created itself? Yes or no? No. Why? They would think uh, some god did it, some alien did it, some advanced human. Why? Because things don't create themselves. I said to him, did you create yourself? No. Did your shirt create itself? No. The tree outside create itself? No. I said, name something that exists that created itself. And he actually had an answer. He said, gravity, with a smile on his face. <sighs> Here's the problem. He thought he was talking to another ignorant Catholic. But here's the thing. I've read the Four Horsemen of Atheism's books. Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins. But when he said gravity, that was Stephen Hawking. Read his book too. And Stephen Hawking says because there is gravity, the universe can and will continue to create itself out of nothing. Here's the problem. I said, and I said that maybe you can answer this for me because Dr. Hawking doesn't do it in his book. Where does gravity come from? So he says, because there's gravity, we create itself out of nothing, but gravity is something. Where did gravity come from? O for 2. I said, you know what? In baseball, three strikes and you're out. I'll give you one more chance. The second law of thermodynamics is called entropy. Entropy measures the level of chaos and disorderedness within systems. So, for example, if you're playing pool and the balls are all nice and racked up, you take the rack off, they're all nice, closed, ordered system. That system has tremendous ability to do work. So we would say it has a low entropy. Tremendous ability to do work, low entropy. Once the rolling ball, the cue ball, hits those balls, it transfers the energy from the rolling ball into those other balls, it disperses the balls all across the table. Now it's a disordered, chaotic system. It, it's a system tending toward equilibrium. It has no ability to do any work because it's disordered. We would say that has a high entropy. Now what do I mean by a system moving toward equilibrium? If you, for example, you have a boiling pot of water and you have a block of ice in the freezer, those are being held together by the forces of heat and cold. If you take them away from those forces, you take it off the heat, you take it out of the freezer, and you leave them on the counter, what's going to happen? Yeah, they're going to get to room temperature. That's called equilibrium. And tropic systems tend toward equilibrium. All right? So I should give you another example, my phone. As my phone exists right now, it is an ordered system. You push buttons, all kinds of things happen, lights go on, functions happen. It is a low entropy system because it has tremendous ability to do work. 
If I take this phone and smash it into 100 pieces on the ground, it is now a disordered and chaotic system. It's tending toward equilibrium. It has no ability to do any work. It, is a, it has a high entropy. Following? So I said to him, since you brought up the Big Bang, what kind of event would have caused the Big Bang? A low or a high entropy event? That caused the Big Bang. Low entropy, because low entropy has the ability to do work, right? So 13.7 billion years ago, boom, there was an explosion. All this work was done, right? Now, I, have, I said I have two questions for you now. Entropic systems have a tendency to lose energy, right? As they become from low to high entropy, they lose energy. For example, when you bought your cell phone, the, and you charge it for the first time, the battery's at 100%, right? When you drain the battery to zero, and you recharge your phone again, your phone still says 100%, but is the battery actually 100%? No, it's 99.999998. And then the next time you charge it, there's less. The next time you charge it, there's less, because every time, because it never recaptures the same amount of original energy. But the universe, 13.7 billion years old, is still expanding. How is that possible after 30? Where's the energy loss? There's still 10 to the 80 baryons of visible matter in the universe. A, a, a baryon is a heavy, sub a heavy subatomic particle. And there's still 10 to the 80 baryons. All this work is happening. Where's the energy loss after 13.7 billion years? How, explain that to me. How could that happen? Second, you can't go from a low entropy to a high entropy back to a low entropy event again. So, for example, if my phone is in 100 pieces on the ground, I can't pick it up, throw it in the air, and it'll come down as a cell phone. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. But yet with the universe, low entropy event, boom, then we had a cosmic soup, disordered universe, but do we have an ordered universe today? Yes. Remember those SpaceX people? They shot something to Mars? It's going to get there a year from now. They could tell you now, within, a, within 100 meters exactly where that probe is going to land. You can't do that unless you have an ordered universe. So how do we get from a, cosmic, a, a, a low entropy event to a high entropy event back to a low entropy event again? How did that happen? Same answer as you, nothing. I said, now you have to apply the law of Occam's razor. Occam's razor says if we have a series of competing hypotheses, each with equally predictive outcomes, the one with the fewest assumptions is the one that's mostly correct. I gave you three assumptions. You could not give me an answer. And notice, my friend, not once did I ever mention God. Not once. So now you must conclude from reason and logic alone that my conclusion is at least possible. That's the answer Albert Einstein came to. Are you smarter than Einstein? And he took his little cart and he walked away. Now, my goal was not to embarrass that man. It, was not, it wasn't all. But this, the reason why I started with that example is to show you how powerful our Catholic faith is. Does anybody, don't, don't say anything. Does anybody recognize those three examples with my cell phone that I gave this, this, this atheist man? Anybody recognize where those three examples came from? You know, Father Masia? St. Thomas Aquinas. There are three of the five proofs of the existence of God by St. Thomas Aquinas. Prime mover, cause and effect, and intelligent design. I, the, I couldn't find examples for necessary being or contingent being. The, the other two 
So I just used those three. But here's the thing. That's how powerful our faith is. Now, if he would have said to me, you can't even prove to me God exists, and I came back with, well, let me tell you what St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest theologians and philosophers that's ever lived, has to say. He don't believe in God. He don't care what St. Thomas Aquinas has to say. So what do we have to do? We take this rich, deep, awesome, beautiful faith and turn it into a cell phone. That. See, and when you tell a young person, you explain it to a young person like that, it's like, now that, see, here's, here's the goal, right? The, the whole reason why we get this evangelization thing wrong, because we think we have to change people's minds. <laughs> wrong answer. That is not the about changing minds and hearts. We can't do that. We're not that good. Only God, the Holy Spirit, can change minds and hearts. We can't. God asks us, like the parable of the sower, to throw the seeds. Some seeds land on rocky soil, sandy soil, thorny soil, where the seed lands. Not our problem. It's the Holy Spirit. What is, what, what, in fact, what does St. Paul says? I seeded, Apollos watered, God gave the yield. God gives the sunlight and the fertilizer. And y'all know something. Y'all got a John Deere plant here. Y'all know something about fertilizer. Y'all know something about planting stuff and, and farming out here. God provides the yield. We have to throw the seed. But check it out. This is how we participate in God's creative plan for salvation. God can't do the work if the seed ain't there. He leaves the work for us to throw the seed. And God takes care of the rest. Now that we've established it's reasonable to believe that God exists, which God? All kinds of gods. Right? We've got all kinds of religions believing all different kinds of things about different kinds of gods. Why the God of Christianity? Right? So I want to do another example. I need somebody who's tall, which is basically anybody but me. <laughs> Is there a guy in here that's, like, tall? You, yeah, yeah, why don't you come up here? Let me put my mask on so I won't get sued. What's your name? Don? Don? Don. Don. Okay, Don. Stand right here. I'm not going to touch you because I, you know, face everybody. Mm -hmm. This is Mount Don. Don represents, you can you hear me with this mask on? Okay, Don represents the mountain of life, okay? He's the mountain of life. Now, I grew up in the city in Newark, New Jersey. I didn't know anything about mountains until I got to Oregon. And I realized that when you go hiking, when you climb a mountain, you have to start at the foot. Sit right here in the middle. Everybody, everybody can see you. Let the people on television see you there, too. You have to start at the foot of the mountain, and you make your way up the mountain to the top, to the summit. That's your goal. Now, if this represents the mountain of life, let's say this front-facing side of the mountain is our Christian faith. What gets us started on our journey up the mountain of our faith life? Baptism! Baptism initiates us into the life of faith. We're baptized into Christ's death. Right? So we we enter into a baptism. Now, as we climb the mountain of life, we can learn things. We can approximate things about God. Right? So, for example, we learned that there is one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That the second person of the Trinity, the Word became, flesh, became our Lord Jesus Christ. He lived for 33 years. He taught for the last three years of his life. And if we follow that he, he died, he rose from the dead, and if we follow the teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, if we cooperate with the grace of the sacraments, if we live according to the law of God and the teachings of the church that he founded, which was the Catholic Church, we'll talk about that in a little bit as well, what's waiting for us at the top of the mountain? Heaven! The beatific vision. Life with God forever! But then there's this side of the mountain. Turn, face Monsignor. There's this side of the mountain. And this side of the mountain, let's say, is Islam. Now, I speak to a lot of people 
when I travel. I have many, many friends who are Muslim. So I teach what they teach me about their own faith. Right? Plus, I've read the Quran. So Muslims also, you know, you start off in the life, there's basically five tenets of Islam. Prayer, which they do five times a day. In fact, a little story. The first time I went to Malaysia, this is how seriously they take their faith there. I noticed all these um, horns, like sirens, all around the city. I thought it was like a tsunami warning system. You know? And I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. They got it sophisticated here. We're eating in a restaurant out, uh, with no walls because they're near the equator. So it's, it's very hot there. All of a sudden, ah, ah, my friend, I, sat, I, was, I went like this. I was like, because I was still a cop back then. I'm like, I reached for my Glock. I'm like, oh, what's going on? He said, what are you doing? I said, what is that? He said, sit down. I'm like, what is going on? All of a sudden, these people start rolling out mats and start bowing and praying to Mecca. I'm like, right in the restaurant. I'm like, dang. These dudes are serious. Prayer, fasting, which is Ramadan, right? Um, prayer, fasting, uh, almsgiving, testimony, and pilgrimage, called the Hajj, which is where they, every year they go to Mecca. Those are the five tenets of Islam. If you live according to those five tenets of Islam, at the end of your life, what's waiting for you if you're a man? 72 virgins. What's waiting for you if you're a woman? Yes, it's pretty unclear, right? But why is this important? Why is this important? I was giving a talk in Sydney, Australia, back in 2016. It was in a place called the Punch Bowl. The Punch Bowl is the, the part of Sydney that's lowest below sea level, very heavily Muslim area. I was given to 800 people were in the church. And during the talk, I was talking about the theology of women. And I said how I thought the Catholic Church had the best theology of any religion about women. And so I talked a little bit of what I did last night. And I started comparing Buddhism and these other places. Not saying, any, not saying that they're bad. I just think we have the best. So I got to Islam. And I quoted one of the surats from the Quran that said, that if you believe a woman did something bad, you can strike that woman. You don't have to see her do it. You just have to believe that she did it and you can hit her. When I said that, a Muslim guy stood up because he was wearing a kufi. He said, no, you misrepresent Islam. Now, there's 800 people in the church. Everybody's like murmuring, like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I said, I said hold on, my friend. I apologize. I said, just like I don't want anybody misrepresenting my faith, I don't want to misrepresent or misinterpret your faith. Can you please tell us what it says? He says, you read English. You must read Arabic. I said, you're correct. I don't read Arabic. I was reading it in English. But although the, the translation I was reading from is considered the best English translation out there by all the imams, but OK. You're right, you must read Arabic, I don't. Can you please tell us what it says? And he said, you don't have to hit her that hard. At which point, people started laughing. He got mad. So now he's trying to yell at me, and now I, I don't want to lose control of things. So I said, you know what, sir? Look, let's do this. I need to finish this talk. But I'm going to ask you two questions right now. If you can answer these two questions for me, I will continue to engage you right now and not finish my talk. If you can't answer them, then please sit down, and I will speak to you for as long as you want afterward. He said, OK. So I said, I've read the Quran. I apologize for reading the Quran in English. But when I read the Quran, I noticed in there that Jesus who you consider just a, a lesser prophet, much lesser prophet than Muhammad, Jesus does miracles, Muhammad does none. How could Muhammad be more powerful than Jesus when in your holy book, Jesus does miracles, 
Muhammad does none. That's my first question. Here's my second. The only woman mentioned by name in the entire Quran is Miriam, Mary, the mother of Jesus, who's spoken of, by the way, with great respect. And by the way, they believe in the Immaculate Conception. Muslims believe in the Immaculate Conception. Protestants don't, but Muslims do. I said, in fact, she almost has an entire section of the Quran dedicated to her. I said, none of Muhammad's mother is not mentioned, nor any of his wives, including his favorite wives, Fatima and Khadijah, are not mentioned at all in the Quran, in your holy book. Only Mary, the mother of Jesus, is mentioned. How can Muhammad be more powerful than Jesus when Jesus' mother is mentioned in the, your holy book and his mother or his wives are not? And he sat down. And I went looking for him after the talk. Couldn't find him anywhere. But what was the point of that story? Simply this. Several months later, I got a Facebook post, a Facebook email from a woman who wrote this. Deacon, I just want to let you know that at your talk in Sydney, my husband and my daughter and her non-practicing Muslim friend went to your talk. After your talk, the non-practicing Muslim friend bought 13 of your CDs. He came home, he downloaded them onto his phone, and he's been listening to you every single day. He now just, he told me just now that he wants to receive instruction to come into the Catholic faith. Now again, that got to do with me? Nope. What did I do? I threw some seeds and God did the rest. That's how effective evangelization works. That's how it works. But we have this side of the mountain. Turn and face to Jesus. We have this side of the mountain, which is Buddhism. Right? So when Siddhartha developed Buddhism, he was trying to avoid two extremes. He was trying to avoid extreme hedonism on one side and extreme asceticism on the other side. So he developed something called the middle way. The middle way. So the middle way is based on the four noble truths. The first noble truth is that we as human beings crave things and crave states in life that leave us ultimately unsatisfied and in pain. That leads to the second noble truth. We enter into this pattern of life, of, of emptiness and pain, death, rebirth, life of emptiness and pain, death, rebirth. In order to break out of that cycle, you have to follow the third noble truth, which is the eightfold path to enlightenment. And if you follow that eightfold path to enlightenment, you get to the fourth noble truth, which is nirvana, which is not heaven. Because nirvana is like monism. It, you become one with the universe. So their whole life, they practice something called the extinguishing of the self. So at the end of your life, you do all these ascetical practices, all these things, in order when you die, there's no you. You cease to exist because now you're one with the universe. But then there's this side of the mountain. Wait, stop, there you go. No, face me, there you go. There's this side of the mountain. This is secular humanism. See, here's the thing. This is the fastest growing faith, by the way, is secular humanism. You see all the studies that come out, how many young people are leaving the faith? Here's the thing. I thought at first, the young, because we always think, oh, they're leaving the Catholic Church, they go to the Protestant Church. Uh-uh. They're leaving the Catholic Church for nothing. The fastest group of young, of, uh, the fastest growing population are the nuns. And I wish I met the sisters. It's the N-O-N-E-S. It's the people that say, what are you? Catholic, Protestant, Buddhist, Hindu, none? They check none. Because they worship at the altar of, of what? They believe in the Trinity. Me, myself, and I. That's their Trinity. Their whole life is centered 
on themselves. They don't need God. They don't need faith. They don't need a church. All I have to do is be a good person. I don't need any church to tell me what to do. That's the moral relativist. That's the secular humanist. They live their lives that way. They're making up the truth as they go along. And what's waiting for them at the end of their life? Nothing. Nothing. Right. Mountain, you don't talk, but you're right. <laughs> Mountains don't talk, but no, you're good. So now, turn around. Oh, oh, wait, just stop, stop right here. So now we have the mountain. So here's what the culture would say. The culture would say, you cannot say that your faith is true. Why? Because you're only focusing on your side of the mountain. You can't take into account the whole mountain, see? And the way you think and what you believe is historically and culturally conditioned. You are historically and culturally conditioned to believe the things that you were taught as a kid. So because that's true, you can only focus on your side of the mountain. You can't appreciate what's going on, spin slowly, on this side, or this side, or this side. Right? So because you can't appreciate what's going on on the other side, you can't say that your side is true. And so what we have to do is this. There is no truth. So it doesn't matter if you're Catholic, if you're Buddhist, if you're Muslim, if you're Hindu, if you're secular humanist. It doesn't matter because we're all going to get to the same place eventually. We're all going to. So what do we have to do? We have to just climb the mountain on our side and we get to the top of living peace and harmony and love. So what do we do? We put coexist bumper stickers on our car and call it good. Now, what's the problem with the statement? No, so that's that's the, what the, the, the culture would say. Doesn't matter what side of the mountain you're on, we're all going to the same place. And so therefore, you can't say there is truth. What's the problem with that statement? What's the problem with the statement they say there is no truth? But what's the problem with making the statement? The statement itself then can't be true. If they say there's no truth, then the statement, there is no truth, can't be true. Because that statement is also historically and culturally conditioned. So the way you get back at them is use their own argument, use their same logic. Well, then that means that you're, that, well, you just told me can't be true. That's called tautology. That's using logic to prove itself. You, so that makes no sense. So they defeat their own argument by making it. So there is truth. For example, if there was an alien that came down from outer space and the alien ran into me and the alien says, I want to learn about the religions of the world and I walk through this example with the alien, the alien would say, wait a minute. Come on. Even I know there's a such a thing as truth. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to explore all of these faiths. I'm going to find the one that's true. So of the four examples that I gave, just from logic, where would he start? In the process of elimination, where would he start first? Which one? Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, or secular humanism? Where would he start in this process of elimination? And why? Any guesses? No? I would say Christianity. He would start there. Why? Jesus Christ is the only one who claimed to be God. Buddha never said he was God. Muhammad never said he was God. Confucius never said he was God. Lao Tzu never said he was God. All these people, they never claimed to be God. Only Jesus Christ said he was God. So you only have two choices. He is who he says he is, or he's completely insane. Only two choices you have. So from process of elimination, the alien says, if this guy is God, boom, done. No need to go any further. I have to listen to him because he's God. If he's not God, take him off the list, move to the next one. So is it reasonable to believe that Jesus is God? 
Thank you, Mount Don. You did an excellent job, my friend. Awesome. All right. So now, some people will now try to tell you that Jesus never claimed to be God. <sighs> they must not read the Bible. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4, remember, the, both of those talk about the temptation in the desert. And when the final temptation, when he says, throw yourself off of the parapet of the temple because the angels will catch you lest you strike your foot against the stone, which is very arrogant, by the way. The Satan quotes scripture to the word made flesh. <laughs> he, he quotes Psalm 91 to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? You shall not tempt the Lord your God, referring to himself. In John chapter 8, this is what got him killed. Before Abraham was, I am. I Remember the, the famous statement of Moses' the burning bush? He goes, if, what, if people ask me, what should, what, what, what should I tell them? What, what is the name? I am who I am. That's what got him killed because he equated himself to be equal with God. <laughs> In John chapter 10, he says, the Father and I are one. He says to Philip in John chapter 14, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus says all over the place he was God. Now, Jesus was the only one whose coming into the world was foretold thousands of years before it even occurred. Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, none of them their coming into it was not foretold, only Jesus. For example, Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm. It's called the messianic psalm of fulfillment, written by King David. 700 years before Jesus. What does it say in that psalm? That's the famous one. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Read the rest of the psalm. They tear holes in my hands and my feet and lay me in the dust of death. I can count every one of my bones. These people stare at me and gloat. They throw dice from my clothes. And here's a verse that a lot of people don't even think about. He says, from my mother's womb, you have been my God. And he, he spends about, about three verses talking about his mother. Um, excuse me, who was at the foot of the cross? Mm-hmm. 700 years before the crucifixion that was written. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus was saying that psalm on the cross. He was letting the people know that this psalm is being fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus does things only God can do. He heals lepers. Opens the eyes of the blind. Opens those who are taught. Those cast out people possessed by demons. Raises the dead with all kinds of people around watching, with witnesses. Why is that important? Muhammad was completely illiterate. He could not read or write his entire life. He says that an angel came and dictated the Quran to him. So he had someone, as, as he was getting these messages from an angel, and who says it was an angel from heaven, Someone was writing stuff down as he was talking. So the only one we have to believe of what he says is him. What about Joseph Smith? You know, Mormonism was founded in upstate New York, not in, not in uh, Utah. It was founded in upstate New York. Now what happened, he said the angel Moroni, who was somehow related to Michael, the angel Moroni came to him and revealed to him as he was using what's called the Urim, and the Thurim, the fact that Jewish people still use that today, if you ever go to the Wailing Wall, they have those little boxes with a piece of the Torah in it, and they put their heads against the wall. He was using one of those. And the angel Moroni came to him and dictated to him and showed him on these golden plates the Book of Mormon. So when the people said, oh, that's great. Where are the plates? Where are the golden plates so we can see them? He said, oh, they were swallowed up by quicksand. Here's the problem. In the history of the entire state of New York, 
there's not any reported places of any quicksand anywhere in the entire state of New York. So the only one you have to believe about what happened was him. Jesus did things with witnesses all around him. He didn't do things in isolation. People saw what he did. In fact, there's something called textual support. For example, how do we know that Socrates wrote Socrates? Were any of you alive back then? Did you actually see him write it? How do we know he wrote it? How do we know it wasn't somebody else? It's called textual support. In other words, you have to have another document outside of that document that shows the validity of the original document. The Bible, and especially the New Testament about Jesus, has more textual support than any other document in human history. There are not just Christian sources. There are over 30 other extra-biblical sources that are not even Christian that mention the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. No one else has that. Not even close. No one except Jesus. Now, <laughs> there, there's still people that want to turn Jesus into a regular... I remember on um, PBS, there was a, a television show called From Jesus to Christ. Anybody remember that? It's called From Jesus to Christ. It was a show that talked about how Jesus was just a regular guy, but over the three centuries after his death, his followers heaped all of this divinity on top of him until in 313, Constantine, with the Edict of Milan, you know, declared Christianity the official religion of the empire, which he did not do, by the way. Christianity was not declared the official religion of the empire until after the death of Constantine. What Constantine did was allow religious plurality. He allowed people to practice their faith without being killed. That's what he allowed. So they said, all, so they turned Jesus into Christ. So what we have to do is to strip away all of that divinity that was added to Jesus to get to the real historical Jesus. Just some obscure rabbi out of some nowhere town of Nazareth who taught, said he was God, they killed him. And the reason why he can't find his body because dogs ate it. There are still homilies being preached where priests are saying things like the miracle of the loaves and the fish. You know what the real miracle was? Here's the miracle. Jesus was preaching and the people's hearts were hard. They were stingy, greedy people. But when they saw that little boy bring forward the fish and the loaves of bread, their hearts were moved with love. And so they all took out the bread and the fish that they had hidden under their cloaks, and they shared them with each other. So the miracle was the sharing. What kind of garbage is that? Jesus fed 5,000 people twice! And it's recorded because all those people were there and saw it. But yet we have people even in the church that want to strip and take away the divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, why the Catholic faith? You know, when I was, when I, well, I'm still traveling, but when I was traveling a lot, like I said, I wear this everywhere, everywhere. I was getting off a plane, and as I was getting off, a woman said, oh, I like your cross. So when she said cross, I knew she wasn't Catholic because she didn't say crucifix, but she was very nice. I said, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. She goes, what denomination are you? And I said, oh, I'm not any denomination. I'm Catholic. And she said, what? I said, well, what are you? She said, I'm Anglican. I said, oh, so Henry VIII founded your church. She said, what? I said, well, um, uh, well, let's, let's go back. I mean, we, let's look at the major religions, right? We have John Calvin founded the Calvinists. Martin Luther founded the Lutherans. Ulrich Zwingli founded the Reform Movement. Uh, Charles Taze Russell founded Jehovah's Witnesses. 
Ellen Gould White founded the Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, Joseph Smith founded the Mormons. Uh, T.D. Jakes founded the Potter's House in 1990, 1996. John Osteen founded the Lakewood Bible Church in 1982. Now his son, Joel Osteen, runs it. I said, keep going. I mean, L. Ron Hubbard founded the Church of Scientology. I mean, just keep going, you know. John Wesley found the Presbyterians. I mean, just keep keep going, going. You know, all these other faiths can trace their origins back to a human person, to a human being. And I said to her, name a Protestant in the year 1000, in the year 500, in the year 100. Yet Jesus says that he came to found the church three times. Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I will build my Church, and then a couple chapters later, Matthew 18, he says, if you have something against your brother, work it out between the two of you. If that don't work, bring some witnesses. If that don't work, take it to the... And if they don't listen to the... Then treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. So Jesus says, my church, the church, the church. So I said to her, What church would that be? What was the only church before Martin Luther? She's thinking, she's thinking, I guess that'd be the Catholic church. Yeah. So we're not a denomination. We're the common denominator. And you used to be able to ask Siri, Siri, who founded the Catholic church? And and Siri used to say, Jesus Christ. Until some Protestants got mad and Google changed the algorithm. Now when you ask, it says, I found three, but one of them is Jesus Christ. It still says Jesus Christ found the Catholic Church. So why, and so I told her, I said, why wouldn't you want to belong to the church that Jesus founded? Here's why. <laughs> For example, because of all the sex abuse stuff that's going on in the church. Why would I want to belong to a church with a bunch of child molesters in it? Hmm, good question. Now, here's how I would answer that. Like I said, I was in law enforcement 23 years, 11 years as a chief. Let's just say one of my officers pulls over a woman for speeding, and he's supposed to ask for driver's license, registration, proof of insurance. He gets to the window, and he notices that the woman is quite attractive. So instead of issuing a ticket... He propositions her to get out of the ticket. Ooh, she is mad. She's incensed. She comes to my office. She files a formal complaint against that officer. I suspend the officer pending a moral turpitude investigation. Somehow it gets leaked to the media. It's the lead story on the 6 o'clock news. All the people see that are mad. That officer was supposed to serve and protect the people. And now he's using his position to take advantage of that woman? And everybody is rightly mad, rightly so, justifiably so. Would your next thought be, well then because of what that officer did, I'm I'm gonna rob banks now, I'm not gonna stop at any stop signs, I'm gonna run every red light, I'm gonna break every law because of what that one officer did? Would that be your next logical conclusion? Then why are you doing for the church? I'm going to leave the church because of what less than 2% of the priests done. By the, and let's be real, I've worked with child molesters, all right? So I know the difference between, I, I know what a child, I used to train my guys on how to look for child molesters because during, at the university during the summer, we used to have kids that come for camp, soccer camp, basketball camp, volleyball camp, and we used to have molesters that used to be around watching and taking pictures of the kids. So I trained my guys how I did, so I work with those guys all the time. What we saw, these priests were not, because look at the ages of the people who are being abused here. A lot of them were teenagers or older. That's homosexual predation. That's not pedophilia. Let's, Let's be real about what's going on here. Yes, there were pedophilia, yes. But a lot of it were homosexual predation. Like Cardinal McCarrick, for example. He didn't molest any little kids. 
So you're going to walk away from the church? You're going to leave Jesus for Judas? <laughs> we have better odds than Jesus did. Jesus had 12 apostles. One of them was Judas. There are always going to be Judases in the church. Get used to it. But you don't leave Jesus because of Judas. Because of less than two. No, no, we don't celebrate. The 98% of the priests, like Monsignor, who die to themselves every single day and give their lives in service to Christ by the church. Those are the kind of priests we need to be talking about. Those are the kind of priests that need to be celebrated. So you're going to leave the whole church for that? See, that people that want to do that, they're just trying to find an excuse to leave anyway. Let me drive the point home to you. My fourth book is on Father Augustus Tote, the first black priest in the United States. He was born a slave in Brush Creek, Missouri in 1854. In fact, on his birth certificate, it says, I mean, on his baptismal certificate, it says Augustus John Tolton, property of Stephen Elliott. Property of Stephen Elliott. His father escaped through the, civil, uh, through the Underground Railroad to fight in the Civil War. He was killed very early in the war. His mother then escapes with his brother and sister through the Underground Railroad to Quincy, Illinois. Now, they were baptized as Catholic. They want to go to church. So they start going to some of the churches in town. The priests and the nuns welcome them with open arms. The parishioners, not so much. Father, we're going to take our kids out of Catholic school if they continue to worship here. Father, we're going to take our financial support away from this parish. We're going to leave the Catholic faith if you let those people worship here. And so a lot of these priests were weak, and they said, well, sorry, Tolkien family, you have to go someplace else. They went to the Italian parish, the German parish, until they got to the Irish parish. Father Peter McGurr, I don't care what these people say you're staying. And he fought those people. He let him stay. Now, Father McGurr saw something in the young Augustus Tolton. And when he got his first communion, he was about 12. He was a little older because he, also, because he wasn't allowed to go to school there, although the nuns uh, taught him separately. He also had to work in a tobacco factory with his mother to help support the family. So he couldn't go to school full time. So when he finally got his first communion, Father McGurr said, there's something about this young man. And he goes and goes, do you ever think you could be a priest? And he goes, I can be a priest? Because he's black. And Father McGurr says, I don't see why not. <laughs> so they start the process, and when he's old enough, because he's been teaching philosophy and theology, and they apply to every seminary in the United States. Every single one rejects him because he's black. Every single one. But how do you come Father Tolton? When everybody else rejected him, the Vatican took him and trained him to be a priest. He loved Rome. It was the first place, he said, where he felt like a human being, where no one judged him, no one looked at me. He said he, the best time of his life was in Rome. After he finished his studies, he thought, okay, they're going to send me to a missionary country where they don't have priests, like someplace, one of the countries on the continent of Africa or maybe you know, some exotic place in the Pacific. Oh, they sent him to a missionary country Back to the United States, back to Quincy, Illinois, the same town he grew up in. Now the roles were reversed. All the white people and all the Asians, everybody's coming to his mass, because first, first it's like, ooh, a black priest, a novelty. But then when they saw his faith, how beautifully he sung the mass, when they saw how passionate he was about Jesus, they started filling his church every Sunday. Ooh, the white priest got jealous. So they told their white parishioners, if you go to his church, it doesn't count for your Sunday obligation. It got so bad. And of course, the bishop supported the white priest. It got so bad that he left and went to Chicago because Archbishop Fian said, come on, you want to come up here. We need you. And he died in 1897. 43 years old, of uremia, which is a complication from heat stroke, because he worked himself to death. In fact, his mother moved there, and his mother was the housekeeper in the rectory where he lived. 
And his mother kept telling him, you can't work so hard. You got to stop working so hard. But he was just so driven that he believed he needed to bring Jesus to people. Now I ask you, why did he stay in the church? I mean, if anybody had a good reason to leave, it was him, and nobody would have blamed him. After everything he had to put up with, why did he stay? Very simply this. Augustus Tolton learned what so many of us fail to understand, especially those who leave the church. What the church teaches is true and good and beautiful, despite the people in the church who are all sinners in need of God's mercy. He focused on the teaching, not the people. That's the, that's the point. What the church teaches is true, good, and beautiful despite the sinners in the church. And we're all sinners in need of God's mercy. And that's what we need to start realizing as well. One last point. I just want to end by showing you this quick example here. Now, the problem is this. We come here, we receive God in word and sacrament, and our job is then to leave this church because the deacon kicks you out the end. Get out of here! Ite misa es. Go, she is sent. That's what it literally means. She is sent. Get out of here. You just received Jesus Christ in word and sacrament in the Eucharist. Now go be Eucharist to the world. That's our job. But the problem is this. When we leave the walls of this church, we confront a world that tries to dictate to us what truth and freedom are all about. And our faith tells us what truth and freedom are all about. And they're not the same thing. So let's take a walk through truth and freedom in our faith and in our culture. So here we are, standing in beautiful St. Catherine of Alexandria Church. We walk out those doors, we go back into the world, and let, let's say this side represents the world. And we step out, of, we go back into the world, and what does the world say every single day to you and to our young people about truth? Truth is relative. Truth is whatever I decide it to be. We even have cultural affirmations for it. That may be true for you, but that's not true for me. That may be your truth, but that's not my truth or my personal favorite. I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. What, what is that? See, here's the thing. People that believe that that is some kind of faith, are building their entire lives on a foundation of Play-Doh. Y'all remember Play-Doh, right? You take it out of the can, and you can twist it and stretch it and manipulate it into whatever shape that you want. That's what they do with truth. Jesus warns us about this. If you don't follow me and my word, Jesus says, it's like building your house on a piece of ground. Right? When they built this church, for example, some of you may be in construction. When they, the permits are approved, the earth moving equipment is there, what direction do they start moving in first? Down. They go down. Because what are they doing? They're building a foundation upon which the structure will stand. Here's what we miss, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Our job as parents, as teachers, as clerics, is not to build the house of our lives for our children. That's not our job. Psalm 127, one of, the, one of the two Psalms written by Solomon, 127 and 72 were written by Solomon. 127 says, if the Lord does not build the house, in vain do the builders labor. Who builds the house? The Lord. What's our job? To lay the foundation in our young people's lives upon which they will build the house of their lives with the Lord. So our job is to help them dig that foundation. But what the culture, don't worry about the foundation, just build on a piece of, Jesus says, the rain's going to come, 
the winds are going to come and wash that house away, and great will be the fall of it. That is our culture today. They want to build their house on the shifting sands of redefinition of marriage, transgender nonsense. They want to build it on abortion, euthanasia, assisted suicide, fetal stem cell research, more relativism, ideological colonization. They want to build their whole thing on the shifting sands of the culture. And that's why the Catholic Church is so awesome. They're not burning Protestant churches in South America. They're burning and looting Catholic churches. Why? Because, many, let's, let's be real here, many of the Protestant churches are like chameleons. The culture turns green, they turn green. The culture turns brown, they turn brown. The culture turns red, whatever the culture is, they change their teachings to match the culture. Jesus Christ did not come to this earth and die so his teachings could be changed by the culture. Jesus came to transform the culture with his truth. Jesus says, if you, if, you follow, if you listen to my word, it's like building your house on a foundation. The wind and the rain are going to come, and that house is going to stand strong and firm. That's the gift of our Catholic faith. That's why we have to strong, stand firm in the face of this culture. And guess what? Jesus says, if you are to be my disciples. And what is a disciple? Someone who hears, understands, and then practices, puts the practice in their life, the teachings of Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith. That's a disciple. Jesus said, if you're already being by disciples, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. And when we actually do that, the same thing that happened to Jesus is going to happen to us. He was spat on, kicked, punched, beaten, mocked, scorned, all the way to the cross. And when we do that same thing, when we stand up for the Catholic principles, we stand up for the natural moral law, we stand up for the, the Ten Commandments, the Aseret Haribrot, the Ten Words of God, when we stand up for the Catechism, when we look this culture in the face and say, I don't care what you say, I'm following Jesus. You're going to get mocked, you're going to get scorned, you're going to get ridiculed, you're going to get made fun of. Get used to it. Put your big girl panties on. Playtime is over. But that's what they're building the house of their life on, these more relativists. So many of our young people, they're building it on Plato. What does our one holy Catholic and apostolic faith have to offer us? Let's see what the faith says about truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the the truth and the life. So truth is not an idea you form in your mind. Truth is not a philosophical construct. Truth is a person. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And when we build our lives on the foundation of the truth of Jesus Christ, what does he guarantee us? The truth will do what? The truth will do what? Set us free to do what? To become the person who God created us to be. Now let's, let's look at freedom. Step back into the culture. What does the culture say to us about freedom? I'm free to do whatever I want, however I want, whenever I want, to whomever I want. And if you don't let me do whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to call you names. Let me tell you some of the names I've been called. You're bigoted. You're closed-minded. You're intolerant. You're homophobic. You don't appreciate diversity. And all the things they throw in your face for making you feel guilty about your Catholic faith. And I say to them, sticks and stones, baby. Call me all the names you want. Because if my Lord can be beat half to death by scourging, and if my Lord can carry the instrument of his own death up a hill, and if my Lord can die on that cross for three hours for my sins, and I can't take when somebody calls me a name because I'm not afraid to live my Catholic faith, I don't deserve to be called a Catholic. There's another name for you, coward. And when you don't live your faith, you spit 
on the graves of all those Christians who died rather than deny Jesus. In the Roman canon, Eucharistic prayer number one, or the long one, right? Felicity, Perpetua, Lucy, Agatha, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia. Why are those names there? Because they sound cool? Those women would rather die than deny Jesus. Die than deny Jesus. In the United States, now in Africa, they're dying over there for their faith. He, Jesus not asking us to die here in the United States, but when we don't speak out against these issues, and we wonder, what happened? That passed. What happened? This person got in office. What happened? What happened? Look in the mirror! That's the problem! You want the solution? Look in the mirror. Enough is enough. We have to start standing for Jesus Christ. Period. That's how we get this culture back. What does our faith say to us about freedom? Jesus says in John's gospel, I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That authentic freedom is rooted in the obedience of faith. It's listening to the voice of God and allowing that voice to change our lives. Because when our, our hopes, our dreams are united where our wills become one with the will of God, our will and God's will are one, that is true freedom. When your will is united with God's will, now you are truly free to be the person who God created you to be. That's it right here. This is freedom. Let me give you a, a, a one last example. Say there's a violin up here. The violin has four strings. The culture will look at that violin and say, you see that string on that violin? See how tight that string is wound around the violin? Look how constricted that string is. It's being controlled and manipulated by the rules and regulations and commandments and moral codes of the violin. That string is it's not free. What do we have to do? We have to free the string. So the culture walks over to the string, takes the tuning peg, whoop, 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 looses that string, pulls it through the tuning peg, off the nut, off the fretboard, off the bridge, and lays it down next to the violin. Now the culture stands back and says, ah, oh, now that string is free. It is no longer controlled by the violence, no longer constrained. The free is now free to do whatever it wants. And I ask my brothers and sisters in Christ, what is that string now free to do? What's the string free to do now? Nothing! It's totally useless! And when we live our lives, truth is whatever I want, freedom is whatever I want, we end up living lives of emptiness, of uselessness, of nothingness. And human beings, that's an uncomfortable position for us to be in, so we have to fill it, huh? Here's how it looks in the culture. Say you get to a certain age in your life. You have everything the culture says you have to have to be happy and free and fulfilled. But you still feel that something is missing in your life. What, what do we call that? Anybody know? When you get to a certain point in your life, you have everything the culture says you have to have, and you're still not fulfilled, you're still, not, you're still searching. What do we call that? Midlife crisis! Midlife crisis. But what is it a crisis of? It's a crisis of faith. But what's the culture's answer to midlife crisis? More stuff. For example, where's my mountain? Tom, right? Don, Don. You drive a car, Don? You drive? You drive? What kind of car you have? A 2015 Impala? Awesome, man. It gets you from here to there. Very reliable. Praise Jesus. That's why you're so miserable. 
Man, this Valley City, North Dakota, bruh. You got to get yourself a candy apple red Porsche with the Bosch speaker system in it, with your Ray-Bans. So when you pull up that traffic light, boom, boom, boom. You're like, yeah, ladies, watch this right here. Yeah. That's why you're so miserable. Ah, oh, see, look at you, man. Oh, I, I know. Oh. Do you own a house? Do you, have, do you own a house? Kind of, sort of. Okay. If you don't mind me asking, what about how many square feet is your house? Oh, heavens, I don't even know. My husband's always building on. Oh, he's adding on to the house? How many square feet is it about you? Uh, let's just say 3,000 square feet. That's a, that's a good sized house. But that's why you're so miserable. <laughs> Look, you have to build another 3,000 square foot addition onto your house because you need some place to put your boat. I was reading a fishing magazine when I was eating dinner last night. There's lakes all over the place up here. You need to have some place to have your boat. You need to impress all your friends and show them how important and special you are. What's wrong with you? Oh, yeah. How many people here have kids? Thank you, Jesus. How many people have more than four kids? Oh, bless you. Oh, Deacon, how many kids you guys got? Five kids. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Those are wonderful kids. That's why you're so miserable. First of all, it's your fault that the earth is dying. You have all those kids. They take the foods out of the mouths of poor kids. And then they uh, uh, breathe. Greenhouse gas, global warming, footprints all over the earth. It's your fault that the earth is dying. And that's the, then the other thing is, of course, your beautiful wife, after pushing out all those kids, she's sagging a little bit. So you got to get her some surgery to get some things back up there again, or even better, get yourself a little something on the side, bro. You know, a little side action, huh? I mean no disrespect, but isn't that the culture's answer to midlife crisis? More of the same. Why? The, the reason why they ask it? Because you're not good enough the way you are. You're not good enough, and the only way you get better is to get more stuff. That's their answer. And people will never find satisfaction in more stuff. I once had a very wealthy man. He heard me on Catholic Answers Live. He wanted me to come talk to him and his wife because they were going through some stuff. I get to this big mansion, big old house, and I sit down to talk to them. And he says, I don't know, honey, why, you, why I don't know what the problem is. I mean, you know, we have, look what we have. We don't have to worry about anything. We have it all. And she says, but I don't have you. So all the stuff is not the answer to midlife crisis. Leaves you empty and void and useless. What about our faith? Our faith would say, that string is not free. That string can't do anything. So what we do as Catholics, we put it back over the bridge, back over the fretboard, over the nut, into the tuning peg, and the commandments and the catechisms, and the scriptures, and the moral codes, and catechism class, and confirmation class, and adult ed, RCIA, helps tune us to the perfect pitch for which we were created. But that's not all. See, the string is not played by itself. That's the culture. It's only when the string is played in harmony with the other strings that now the entire instrument has purpose and has meaning. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we're the string. And it's actually the commandments and the laws of our church that free us to become the person God created. It doesn't restrict us. The culture says, you know, you can't have sex before you're married. You can't do this. And that's how the kids learn the faith. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't. But it's like learning an instrument. You have to practice. Oh, I don't want to practice. But it's exactly because of practicing that you're able to do amazing things on an instrument. And you know what practice is called for us? Virtue. When we practice as a friend, we live virtuously, and we have to sacrifice things to be virtuous because our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, so we sacrifice the things of the world. And when we do that, Christ can now tune us and shape us to be who he created us to be. Now we're free. 
we're truly free. And that's why we're Catholic. Our faith frees us. Because when he died, he conquered death. That's why he had to die, by the way. Death was the worst effect of sin, being cut off from God's life. And he freed us from death by rising. Our faith frees us so that we can become truly children of God and the body of Christ. And so, my brothers and sisters in Christ, our faith cannot be hidden from the world. We have to roll away the stone of fear and anxiety and uncover the power of God's Holy Spirit who wants us to work in and through Christ to make his resurrection meaningful to the world. We have to say with St. Paul and truly mean it. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives and breathes and moves and loves in me. Amen. Thank you all very much.